Good evening, everybody. We are back on the scene. This is Joe Ryan. Welcome back. And tonight, we have the pleasure of having an original. An original from the New York Mets, Bruce Fitzpatrick. Bruce, how you doing? Great, Joe. Nice to be here. Hey, good to have you here. Now, Bruce, um, you know, let's start back at the beginning. Um, you're kind of a, you're a New Yorker now, but you were originally... Massachusetts guy. So we grew up as a Boston Red Sox fan in yep. Newton, Massachusetts. Yep. Let's talk about your, your beginnings in baseball. Spalding. <laughs> That's how it started. Okay. Yeah. There it is right there. The Spaldini? I grew up in an apartment complex for a number of years during that 8, 9, 10 age. And my dad, um, because all we did was play with Spaldings and uh, broomsticks. Right. He said, um, I think you should become a switch hitter too. And that was huge. Yeah. So that's started it. And then I never really saw a, a big league game till maybe when I was 13. Cause we had lived in St. Louis. We moved to, to the Boston area. And, um, but, um, I went over to to uh, Forest Park in Springfield. We lived across the street for, for a while, and Forest Park had summer ball. And I went over there, and I saw these guys playing, and they were older. And, and it, I said, oh, I wonder what's going on here. So I got to stand right behind the bench and watch. They're probably college. They're big kids. And I watched them for a while. I said, you know, i like to do this. I think I could do this. Not knowing, of course, that whether I could or not, but right. it, it fascinated me. So that that was the beginning of it. And um, um, I had great genes. My father was a catcher at Syracuse, big time football player in Springfield, Mass. He knew the game. And um, so I got the genes. Um, we were living in St. Louis. He got promoted to Boston. He was going to have New England. He sold cereal. He was a I'm a uh, Rice Krispies guy. Oh, there you go. And um, snap, crackle, uh, snap, crackle and pop. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now we could have moved to, to Needham. We could have moved to you know any place in the greater Boston area. And he picked Newton. Unbeknownst to him was the fact that Howard Ferguson, who was recognized as probably the best high school baseball coach in the country, was the head coach at Newton High School. So I got the jeans. I got Ferguson. I had the switch hitting. Um, when I um, accepted the honor of being in my high school athletic hall of fame, I said, if I wasn't standing here, it'd be shame on me. Right. So, yeah, you know, back then when you were kind of, when you were coming up, baseball was truly, and I don't want to say it's not any more than national pastime, but that was a dream of every boy. You know, football kind of is, is pushed to the, a little bit of ahead of baseball now, I guess, a little bit. Um, basketball and hockey have their places. But baseball at the time, that was the dream of every boy to be to play baseball. How did it feel like when you knew that you were you were going to have a chance to play professional baseball? I did real well when I was like 15 with college kids, uh, hitting against them. And, and my father said, listen, I think you could become an elite ball player. But you got to break it down. Bunting, base running, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I didn't have any um, rush to judgment. I had work to do in all these different areas, and um, I worked at it. Um, went to a great baseball high, high school, and the thing that, that really hit me with the beginning of my senior year, as the season started, suddenly the scouts were there. I mean, yeah. you know, 10, 12, uh, it, was, it was electric. Uh, and we got bigger crowds because, you know, they, they knew something was up with me. We'd known that for a few years because I had done very well in town. And it was the kind of town everybody kept track of how everybody else was doing. Right. So it, um, that was incredible. It just blew my – and it blew all the players on the t team's mind because they thought, oh, we'll all get the sign. Which, of course, wasn't true. <laughs> and so, I mean, I see a lot of, I, I covered a lot of high school sports around here. Mm -hmm. and, I, and The scouts don't come around like they do anymore. It's all about these 
AAU showcases and stuff. When when you had that kind of attention, did it help that your father, you know, like you said, he played at Syracuse, he had played at a high level. Did he help give you keep a balance with you with that? So maybe it didn't go to your head. Was it, was he an important influence there, being a mentor for you going through those stages? First thing is he never let me know he was at a game. He was Mr. Binoculars. He didn't want to trespass on my. Um, I never played catch with him. I don't believe. Really, but he, he would. He would. For instance, he said, "Look, always look the best on the field. The stirrups up. Always look like, look like a pro. The shoe shined. You know what I mean? I played football, and he bring in a." a fresh pair of white laces on Friday night. <laughs> and he tossed them to me and said, make sure the shoes will shine too. Um, My mother would have been proud and happy with that. <laughs> I made an error in a game and we had a beautiful field. It, it was Fenway Park transferred because Fenway changed the grass. So we got the field. It was unbelievable. I made a, I made a, I came up on a double, on a, on a ground ball and I threw my legs. I turned, I ran, I dove, and I got the ball, and I came up, and the first guy went on the bay, round at first, he stopped and went back. So I'm at breakfast a week later, my, on that weekend, my father said, I like that play that you made against Brockton. And I said, which one? And he said, um, the one that went through your legs. And I said, really? He said, yeah, look, the scouts don't expect you to be perfect, right? but they want to see what you're going to do when there's a mistake. And you, what you did was right on. Yeah, exactly. So you that's the kind of input he would reinforce. You know, playing the game the way it should be played. And of course, that tied in with Ferguson because our coach. We had cookies and coke in Fergie's living room starting in January with a playbook. I mean, this is this is serious business yeah. in high school. Yeah, definitely for that for that kind of intense pre preparation. I mean, Ferguson was a maniac. He, he he was the Vince Lombardi of baseball. Sure. I mean, he was phenomenal. But and I remember I took a remember there was a guy named Wilbur Wood. Yeah, left-handed pitcher. Yeah, knuckleballer. Yeah, but he was more of a curveball pitcher in high school. So we're facing him, and I'm a sophomore, and it's being I'm being hyped as the starting shortstop. It's becoming a big deal in school. And I took a called third strike with the bases loaded with off of Wilbur. And I froze and Ferguson kicked dirt at me. He cursed me. <laughs> he he was he, he, in my face. I and I stood up and said, Coach, it won't happen again. And he said, Damn, bed not happen again and kicking me and well, he, he said, "You think I'm?" And he said, "I th and to think I'm thinking of starting you." You know, he was like. <laughs> so I had some good people around me, but it did push you to get better, which you, which you definitely helped out since you you got through Mets. When did when did the scouts oh, talk about the transition from high school into pro? You went in plus college. You know, what what was going on in your life then? Well, I signed. My dad said. I'd love for you to go a semester a year to college. Didn't make me promise. He just said, I'd like to see you, and I'd like to see you graduate. So I had those things sort of in my head the whole way, and I'm playing, going back to school, playing, going back to school for four years, and then suddenly the Army, Vietnam, I got a letter, you're drafted. So that ended that. But that was okay because I had, I had, I had a great time. I got I got decent money from the Mets. I had a good year, my fifth, my last year. It's you know twenty seven home runs, so um, I went out with a smile, so to speak. And then I went from that to the University of Connecticut and moved on. So let's talk about your playing time with the Mets. Um, you signed. What year did you sign with the Mets? What was your first year? Sixty one. I signed. And the first spring training was sixty two. So you were the if you were one of the original Mets. I am the the original Met. Uh, Johnny Murphy um, had given me the pen, and I had signed the contract. He was standing behind me, and I turned around and handed it back to him, and he said, "Congratulations, you're the first New York Met." And he said, and I'm a rookie assistant GM 
and you're my first signee. So he said, "Good luck to both of us." So let's talk. So about that when, began it. Now, when you get to the Mets, it was it was a it was a, a big thing in the city because the New York had lost the Dodgers and the Giants in '57. Mm -hmm. So the Yankees owned the town. But the Yankees always did own it town to a point. But anyways, the, <laughs> there was no National League team. But the, the, all the, the National League people, to get a team back, that was a big time. That was a big thing. Uh, the Mets at the time, you know, they get Casey Stengel. Um, they also got a lot of the older players to fill in the voids. They, the younger players had to wait your turn. Talk about what was Wait, going on. I was on. the only teenager. Right. But, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, they, you, had, you had guys there like... Um, Ashburn. Yeah. Frank Thomas. Right. These were 30 Zimmer. Right. I mean, I was like playing with my father, I mean, in a funny way. But what was it like for you as a young teenager going to camp with these guys that had been around? With okay. What Howard Ferguson did was instill grit. And he taught us how to play baseball. I knew rundowns. I knew pickoffs. Um it crossed my mind when I signed. I wonder if, because Murphy said, I want, I want you in spring training. We're going to add you to the 40-man roster. And I said, you know, I wonder, am I over my head? I mean, am I going to get on that field? And I thought about it a little bit. I said, you know, no. That's true. I could play better than most of those players. It took me a while to learn how to hit. That's what they could do. Mm -hmm. See, they know how to lay off pitches and, you know, took me four or five years before I started to get the hang of it. But um, it was, I wasn't intimidated. I wasn't, not at all. Now, when the first people you, you crossed paths with, I think you said was Rogers Hornsby, the great my, Hall my, of Famer. My dad said, listen, I think you signed with, you signed with the Mets, you get Rogers Hornsby. You go from high school to Rogers Hornsby. Yeah. And that was, um, that was big. I mean, I I've read the histories of Rogers Hornsby. A lot of people. Let's give people the the, the history on Rogers Hornsby and what he was like as a coach. I mean, one of the great hitters of all time. There was no he, he matches up there with any of the great hitters in in the history of baseball. Ted Williams says he's the best. Well, let's look at the, five pretty, years. He batted over four hundred. Yeah, that's that's pretty good endorsement when Ted Williams again tells you he's the best. I so mean, I, I got in a cage for the first time, and Hornsby's there right behind the net in front of me with with Stengel. And I'd already um, done bunting. He said, I want to see a bunt. You know, righty, a switch hitter, lefty, drag bunt. This and so Stengel says, how's he doing? And Hornsby says, he can bunt. I think I'm going to like him. <laughs> so then he said, okay, let's, let's swing. You know, let's. Now I'm facing like Al Jackson. Right. I'm facing guys in batting practice that are pitching faster than I'd, than I'd ever seen before. Right. I mean, it was like, but nah, it was all right. And um, I got in the thing, and the uh, Rogers, uh, uh, Raja, which we, what we call him, he said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. And he came in, and he, and he lowered my hands. He says, that way you'll hit less ground balls, more line drives with your hands down low. Right. He said, hands up, you hit ground balls. So he took five or six swings at the end of each day's batting practice, and I was like glue with him. I was like a puppy dog, you know. Yeah. And because and he and he liked me. We 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 clicked, you know. Like, um. So he um he said, "Let me let me let me grab a bat and he get in the cage." And this is true, Joe. Went like three days, and and it, it, I said he came out of the cage after the third day, and I said, "I haven't seen you hit a ground ball." Per the yeah, he put his hand on my shoulder. He never called me about my name. He says, "Son, you don't hit four hundred hitting ground balls." <laughs> okay. Who were some of the other players that had like influence on you when you first Zimmer. Had Zimmer? Zimmer was over third. I'm a short. We're taking infield. We're throwing a ball around, I, and I could throw. What it's one of the, you know when you do your assets and liabilities. My arm. And Zimmer would go, hey, slow it down. You're making people look bad. <laughs> That's true. How, what was Zimmer like? A lot of people just remember Zimmer as the coach, the coach in the Yankees and everything. Well, talk about what, what Zimmer was like as a player and, and as a mentor for you. He was just 
tough as nails. You know, he he, he, had, a, he had a plate in his head. Yeah. And in batting practice, once in a while, I wanted to get close to, he go, hey, you trying to put me in a hospital again? <laughs> he had a great attitude. We went to Fort Lauderdale. He said, Fitz, uh, Yankees. Uh, he said, Fitz, you want to meet Mick and Raj? Yes. Come on. So we're on the field, and it's that's the year after Maris hit 61. Okay, so 62. Didn't break Ruth's record, but he had 61. Well, I know. So the asterisk. Zip. And, and that's the other thing. Zimmer is not Zimmer. He's Zip right. to people that know him, right? And he says, come on, let's go. So we went around the place with cameras, and it was jammed, you know, um, before the, 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 the game started. And as we walked, it, it was like the sea opened. Whoop, Zimmer's coming. And we went up, and he introduced me to Mickey and to Raj, and Mantle said, um, good luck, Rook. He said, where are you from? I said, um, not near Oklahoma, <laughs> up, up in the Boston area. And he said, okay. He said, he was, he was nice. He was friendly. Uh, Maris was sort of, he didn't care. I, but didn't you tell me that uh, Mick kind of gave you a wink or something? Yeah, so um, I'm at short that day, and Mantle comes up right-handed. We got a lefty pitching. Hits a ball, a rocket, maybe 10 feet above me. And, it was, and you know, and he, he came around first. I inched toward the baseline, not to crowd him, but I wanted to – this is an opportunity of a lifetime. Right. I'm I'm on the same field with Mickey Mantle. Right. Right. And um, as he wa- as he ran by me with that little joggy head, he turned his his head toward me, gave me a wink. <laughs> so that made my career. Wow, I was, uh, you're getting I mean, that was pretty cool. You had more to play. Now, your your first uh, year, you get sent to Auburn, New York, correct? Yep. Uh, talk about your experience in, in, in the minor leagues in Auburn because you, as you said before, were the member of the first pennant winning team for the Mets. Not well known, but the first their first pennant winning team. That's true. And I got a picture that I gave uh, Stephen. Yeah. Of us in the restaurant. Uh, we were good, and we got better because, like, Cranepool signed in June. Right. So he joined us. Uh, my my friend, uh, my second baseman, uh, Dick Haymore, um, he'd been an All-American basketball player at uh, Richmond. I mean, we had some athletes, and um, um, it was a great league to be in as a kid. Batavia and Olean and Geneva, little towns, and, you know, the bus rides weren't mammoth. Um it was it was a marvelous experience, and the town was just bonkers over us. What were the crowds like in 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 those type of towns? Because around here, after the seventh inning, drunk. <laughs> we're, I mean, we're, well, I mean, what else are you going to do in Auburn, uh, New York? Yeah, true. But all I mean, you got there was a prison. Yeah, I guess. But it's, we, we, we get spoiled around here. It's like you know, we had the bluefish for a while. Uh, we have some uh, some teams in upstate uh, Connecticut, but it you know everybody thinks Yankees, Mets, or Reds going up to a Red Sox game, whatever. No one thinks of minor league baseball around here, so everybody thinks of it as like low level, you know. And so people don't tend to go to it, I guess. But was it at that time was it getting good crowds? I mean, before they uh, maybe tipped a few by the seventh inning. We maybe the stands held okay. five thousand. It was packed. And, and there was one guy, I'm, I'm looking toward first base at short, and there's one guy around the seventh or eighth inning every night, he would yell, Fitzpatrick, you're a bum. <laughs> Loud. And he, he would do it like once or twice an inning, but only in the seventh and eighth, and I guess when he had enough um, beer or whatever. Um, so there was some really... Neat things. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm reading the you know the the Times. My nickname was College Boy. Yeah. You know I got my books because I've already pre enrolled for the next semester. You know I'm reading the Times. And all of a sudden the guy in front of me reaches down, takes a match, and lights the bottom of the paper. Wow. <laughs> I mean it, we did some crazy stuff. It was fun. Now 
you you went into the military. You uh, you got drafted uh, just as the Mets were kind of getting ready to take off. You told me like Bud Harrelson was showing up, Kenny Boswell, so many other players who would be on that '69 team, and you probably would have had that place on that team. When you look back, a little bit of Moonlight Graham in there. What if what if I could have had my chance, or you know, in, 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 in something you settled okay with? Um. I got to serve. I got to go to a good college. Got my economics. I came down to Stanford. My account had been with Merrill for, you know, seven years at that point. I was 25, 18 to 25. The boss was a Queens guy. He hired me. So that was, see, so I, I moved on. Then I was with Merrill for 50 years. Right. So, I can't look back and and you know try and rewrite. I I, I did great. I mean, from my own perspective, right. which is all that counts. You know, you how'd it go? It went good. It went really good. You got to live out your dream. Um, now, one thing that I know we want to talk about because you want to message out to people. What is seven years ago now or four years ago? Four years. Four. Four years ago, heart transplant and a heart attack. Go ahead, and people would not believe, will not believe when they see this that you had a heart transplant because how good you look. So let's go in and tell me the story of that. You're looking at a 40 year, 48 year old guy. Mm -hmm. I had a birthday last week. John Wolf, who was my donor, um, had the heart attack. Um, then I had to wait. I was at Westchester Medical. Um, yeah, it was just uh, seven months. I couldn't leave because they had me on a, a drug to keep my my heart, you know, beating. And I uh, never knew when it was going to end. Um, so um, it um, finally got a heart. John, he, bad for him, good for me. Mm -hmm. uh, so I spent my time now talking to people and. You know, John saved seven people. Right. I mean, literally. Uh, and too many people never get that heart. Right. I, when I got to Westchester Medical in September, there was a guy leaving. He'd been there a year. He was like me. He couldn't leave without the drug, you know, helping him. So well, I what is the message you want to get out to people about those organ donorship? What 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 kind of message do you want to get out to people about about helping people with those kind of situations? See, if if, if I get someone to, to agree to be a donor, I figure I've saved lives. Now, each person may never be a donor because the way things work out, but I figure easily over two hundred people and. The four years have signed up. So I'm like a fisherman, you know, more lines in the water. I'll save some lives. Uh, there's an old Jewish expression, you save one life, you save the world. Mm -hmm. That's what I operate on. Well, Fitz, you and also Ed Cranepool just had his the kidney transplant. So yeah. both of you. He was in bad shape, yeah. too, because he had the same problem. Right. Couldn't find one. Right. Um, so it's tricky. So so it is important for people to don't, but to be, be donors. To be this. There's almost no reason not to. Um, and I tell people, look, uh, if, you, if you're going to go to the website and sign up, make sure you tell your family. You don't want your grandmother freaking out when they know you're going to be uh, um, dismembered right. and save lives as opposed to being in, the, in a, a box in a casket. Uh, you got to make sure everybody knows uh, – one woman said, "I'll become a donor, but I'm on take my eyes." I said, "We can, <laughs> we can handle that." Hey, that's but she's still going to save five, six lives, which is important. I know I have a friend who's just going through it. Like I told you before we came in the air, he just had a heart transplant about four yeah. minutes ago, and it's it's saving his life. So it's, it is important to get out there. Now, overall, we gotta we gotta touch on the Mets before we we wrap up here. <laughs> The Mets now, do we think we're heading in the right direction as a Mets fan? Or we, we got Pete Alonzo, we got Conforto, we got Rosero, we got that pitching staff. What do you want to see from the Mets in this offseason? They did it. I wanted a player to be manager, not a pitching coach. 
See, I don't believe the pitchers know the game. Okay. I want a player and a good one because I want to have my manager, which our new guy is, a, a star. Because mm-hmm. Alonzo's a star and Conforto and it, we want everybody to be, you got to have the manager to be a star also. Do you like today's baseball? Yeah, I love it. Really over to the baseball we had before? Because everybody grumbles. Well, see, I don't, look, I, it's annoying sometimes when a guy takes a picture out and then the next day he takes a picture out and, you know, he goes on and on. <laughs> I, I don't, look, I can't control that. Um, I just want to see the game. Um, I'm not going to second guess the manager because what do I know? I, I coached in, um, Fairfield for five years in my 30s, uh, semi-pro kids, all college kids. So I managed. Right. So I got to see it a little bit, you know, through a different prism. And um, I'm glad I I had played, you know, because I knew how to play. Um, You know, like I I was in spring training and I was sort of, they were sort of belittling me, you know, like like we're doing uh, pickoffs at second where the pitcher whirls around, throws to the and I say, I say, you guys are doing this all wrong. Oh, 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 the rookie says we're doing it all wrong. <laughs> oh, you know, oh, well, what should we do then, right? That's what they did. I went to the pitcher. I told him how to, what I wanted to do and put my arm up, boom, boom, boom. See, Howard Ferguson taught me how to play baseball. Mm-hmm. Have, have the Mets been good to you in your, uh, you know, bringing you back and things like that? I mean, for events? I didn't have and- much association with them, but uh, my son called – uh, Will uh, Carafano, who is uh, director of social media, and said, you know, you got we, one of your players is in the hospital. And Will came up uh, and visited me at Westchester. Um, he got to meet my cardiologist, you know, Greg Lanier, and we're all, you know, like a little family, although I'm, I'm in there for the long haul. Right. He brought me blankets and decals and my my boys brought in desks, lamps. Um, the head of the hospital is a Mets fan. Oh, I didn't okay. get SNY. Remember, this is 15 when the Mets were in the pennant race. Right. I didn't get SNY on the TV. I called a, I called Dr. Lanier. I said, hey, I got to talk to somebody about this TV. Came in. Um, I, I did a picture. We got it to the... Uh, head of the hospital. The next day, there are a bunch of doctors in my bed. You know, it's a teaching hospital. And in comes a guy with a, a ladder and, you know, all the gear. He's obviously the cable guy. And he said, oh, I'll, I'll come back. I said, no, 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 no. You come right in. You, they're <laughs> you first. And he changed the, He added the channel. <laughs> hey, um, now you're into horse racing, racing as well. And uh, I, I, we, you extend me a invitation to come up to uh, Saratoga during the summer. So yeah. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, now, what's, what's your horse that's uh, got a big chance now? Well, we got Trillions, who's a trotter. Uh, she's uh, three years old. And then we've got uh, Karma, who um, was given to us by the biggest breeder in New York State. Karma was hurt, had a, had a um, uh, ankle problem. So they couldn't sell him at Keeneland. So Joe, uh, John uh, called us, the breeder, and he said, look, I got this horse. I, I don't want to deal with it because he doesn't. I got it. He he breeds the horses. Right. So he said, if you want to take the horses, you can get it get them well, and we did. All right, all right, Bruce Fitzpatrick. We can't thank you enough for coming <laughs> up and giving us your story. I'd love to have you back again, and we're going to do that Saratoga trip because I want to sit there and watch your horse win on the back Karma. And exactly, we're going to see Karma win. On the back. So this is Joe Ryan with the Connect uh, Sports Scene. This is Fitz, one of the the original Met, the original Met. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.